Hello, in this talk I'm going to tell you what happened to me when I was in ICU almost two years ago. There will be more talks later as a lot happened after I left. I found this talk difficult to write. I've told people about my stay in ICU before, but I'm going to tell you about things that I haven't told anyone. So writing this script for this video has been rather emotional for me. ICU at the time didn't keep diaries, but luckily my mum does. So the following is a combination of my memories, my mum's diaries and things my friends have told me. I hope it's in the right order. Before I became ill I was generally fit and well. There was always something going on in my life, but now looking back on things there was nothing that serious. I'd only been in hospital once and that was when I was 8 years old. I stayed in the hospital for, for a little while, which I don't remember much about, then I had a small day case operation. I work in IT, which means that friends, family, ask me techie things like how to fix their iPad, how to email, how to order shopping, basically free IT support, but I enjoy doing that. I guess they think I earn lots of money, but that's not really the case. In the office where I work, we were just going through a major refurbishment. My boss was forming a new sub-team of product people to work on small projects. The weekend before I was ill was early November, so I went into a town near where I lived to watch the fireworks with a friend. There must have been hundreds of people there, as I remember pushing through crowds in the streets. The next day, Sunday, I was working at my parents' house, helping my dad build a fence. It was getting near the end of the day when I started to get a migraine, which isn't really that unusual for me. I felt tired, slightly muzzy, and I think I was getting a little bit frustrated, so I stopped the work and went home. I think the working week was fairly usual as I don't remember anything special. Although I know I was a bit stressed about work at the time and there was a lot going on. My colleagues later said they see, thought I had a cold, seemed to have a cold, and on Thursday I left early as I felt a bit rough. Recently I've had some memories of going to bed wearing my thick dressing gown and shivering and feeling not quite right. I know this definitely happened at some recent time but I'm not sure if it was that point just before I was ill. On Friday, I texted my line manager to say I wouldn't be in. I did say I phoned the office later, but I never did. So the next thing I remember was early, Sunday, early Saturday morning, 7th of November 2015, I was sitting on the floor by my toilet. I thought I was going to be sick, and uh, I know I didn't feel, felt like I didn't get much sleep the night before. It felt a bit like a bad hangover, but I hadn't been drinking. I had a quite bad pain in my stomach. I think I waited for a bit because it was quite early so I waited for it until it was about 7 or 8 in the morning and then I texted a friend who lives about 20 minutes drive away and asked her advice and if she should come over. She later told me that uh, by what I said on the phone she thought I had gastroenteritis. So the front door was locked so I crawled to the front door and unlocked it. Then I must have felt even more ill because then I decided to phone 999. Something in my head told me to ring the ambulance and I think that saved my life. I live on my own and it was the weekend. I booked the next week off work because I had the plumbing coming around. So I thought that if something happened to me I wouldn't have been discovered for a few days. I don't remember what I said on the phone, just that very soon after the ambulance, a paramedic and my friend all arrived about the same time. I was carried on a chair into the back of the ambulance. I remember thinking this would be my first ambulance ride. I could only blink one eye at a time, a bit like this, and that felt very odd. I think I told my friend not to worry my parents as I thought I would be home by the evening. And when the ambulance set off, I realised it wasn't that comfortable and I wanted to be in hospital quickly. Then I was in A&E. I don't remember much about what happened there, but my friend was with me. She later told me what happened. I said I was worried about my arms and legs and to tell my parents that I love them very much. I think I must have realised that something was very wrong but my mind had blocked all of that out. I was seriously ill, I was taken up to ICU and put on a ventilator very quickly. My parents soon arrived and were told by the doctor that he didn't think I would survive the weekend. On Sunday the 8th of November the next day the doctors identified the bug as meningococcal septicemia. 
This is bacterial meningitis. The infection crosses over to the blood and causes blood poisoning. I heard that before this diagnosis was made, I was given some general antibiotics, which luckily were also the right ones for fighting this infection. There's been a lot in the news recently about sepsis and the speed of the diagnosis and the treatment is quite crucial. I was put on a kidney dialysis machine. Two days later, I was shown a slight improvement. I had blisters on my arms and legs, which were burst and were weeping, but my consultant was more optimistic. Meanwhile, I was feeling relaxed and peaceful. The Prince of Saudi Arabia had contacted my boss, who formed that special team of people to work on special projects. His father, Kim Salman, had died recently. Now he was running the country and inv invited me there to track down a terrorist. He needed someone from outside the country, unknown to the terrorists, to find him. I arrived in Saudi Arabia and spent a few months blending in. I grew a beard, wore the local clothes, my skin got tanned and I changed my name. I remember trying to pronounce my name and learning a little Arabic. Eventually I tracked down the terrorists and captured him single-handed. I was a hero, but I was shot three times in the chest. The doctors in the hospital kept looking at my chest. I had some kind of infection, I see him from the bullets, and they were trying to tell what it was. There was a group of special scientists who found a cure and they gave it to me. I asked the nurses how I got to the hospital and I was, as I was on my own when I was shot. They asked me if I knew where I was. I knew I was in the capital of Saudi, but I couldn't remember the name. The hospital looked lovely. The prince had paid for me to go into a private hospital. I had marble columns and floors. The nurses were amazing. I kept saying that the nurses back home didn't do as much as the nurses did here. I think I mentioned something about nurses' pay, which is always a sensitive subject back in England. I got better. The prince wanted to see me, but then something happened and I got worse, and I had to go back into hospital again. I think they thought I was going to die, so there was some talk about sending someone else to see the prince instead. I did get better enough to go home. The prince arranged for me to fly on his super fast jet, and then I was in a hospital side room at the airport waiting to see him. Armed guards were in the room with me. Security was very high due to the threats from the terrorist sympathisers. There was a machine gun mounted on the outside of the building and it blew up a car on the street below because it had terrorists inside it. I moved in the bed and they almost shot me, but my friend said I was a hero to the policeman to stop him. I remember the policeman saying quite loudly in my ear, I won't hurt you bud. I was on my way home but then I got lost in a storm. I was found on a hill beside a seaside town near me, and then I finally woke up. Those dreams and several others were very vivid and seemed to be real life to me. I still remember almost every detail, even now almost two years later. Some dreams were quite nice, so I was quite upset they weren't real, like meeting our royal family and going to university for a year and getting a good qualification. I'm not really sure what I said to the nurses around me, but they still looked after me. After I later left ICU, I wrote down my dreams and memories so I could understand what happened to me. I've since found out there were some real things mixed into my dreams. When the doctors were looking at the bullet wounds on my chest and a rash, they were probably looking at the meningitis rash. The King of Saudi Arabia in fact died in January 2015, 11 months before I was ill. I've only recently found this out. So how did I know that at the time? In a later talk, I'll be discussing how patients hear things going on around them while they're in and out of consciousness, and combined with the drugs, this can lead to some amazing dreams. I was so high on drugs, I didn't know where I was. Dreams were so realistic that sometimes they rewind and start again. So back to real life. Quite early on, I knew I wanted to go home, but something was stopping me. I didn't know what. One week after admission, I was off the ventilator and trying to talk. I said, Mum, how long have you been here? What is it? They spoke to me a lot and I was nodding and looking at them both very sleepy. A few days later I had a CT scan which showed no cause for concern. I guess they thought I was a bit nuts as I thought I was in Saudi Arabia. I had dreamy memories of seeing a corridor, maybe even of the machine. I had a blood transfusion as my cell counts were low. I remember thinking I had four bags of blood, but I doubt it was that many. 
As I mentioned earlier, I booked a week off work, so my employer was not aware of what had happened. So soon after the date I should have gone back to work, my mum contacted Matt, my boss, and explained everything to him. He was so very supportive and had a lot of things for my mum. Meanwhile, exciting developments, my stomach was making noises. Apparently the nurses had trouble waking it up. I had a bowel movement in the night. It se I seem to remember a nightmare dream involving that. I was talking a little, I was difficult to understand. The physios had got hold of me and hoped I'd be sitting in a chair the next day. Two weeks after admission, I think I said something about being bored, so the nurses wheeled in a DVD player. They had some slightly old titles to watch, but I settled on a film called Alexander, which is about Alexander the Great, and I'd seen that before. I think they played the video three or four times because I kept falling asleep. But I remember one time they paused it to do something to me, and they happened to stop it at the only raunchy spot in the film. I started to have issues with my chest and throat. The nurses had to give me suction using a tube put down my throat. That was a very unpleasant experience. I remember a particular nurse being in a dream I had. She was working in a pub with me and I was ill, so she had to do the suction on me. She was telling me off because I wasn't coughing at the right time. Much later I went back to ICU and I actually met her. I asked her if any of this really happened. She couldn't remember it, but she said I was very delirious at the time. Sometimes doctors and nurses give you too much information. Sometimes you just don't understand what is happening and what to do. The next thing that happened has given me scary flashbacks for a long time. The nurses were putting a special plastic hood over my head to help me to breathe. I thought I was going to suffocate in a greasy and smelly bag. I vividly remember my parents being there and I kept saying, help, call the police, call 999. My parents have since told me how upsetting this was to watch and the nurses said it was quite normal. Overnight, my mum and dad were contacted by the hospital. I was having problems with breathing and secretions, so the doctors had decided to put me back on the ventilator and under sedation. This might tie in with my dreams of getting better and then getting worse. When my parents visited me the next day, I was sleeping soundly. In one of my dreams, I was walking on a red hot metal walkway. I could feel the soles of my feet burning. When I was awake, the doctors would pile into the room. There were quite a lot of them. One would sit down at the computer just to my right and type away. I could hear them discussing something. At one point, a doctor introduced himself and he said I might remember him from before. I thought it was familiar and I said, yeah, you're in a dream I had. The doctors asked me to wiggle my toes. I tried and then they said, okay. And I remember thinking at the time, hang on a minute, give me another try. At some point before this, my blood pressure had crashed. I was given a drug called noradrenaline to help raise my blood pressure. This constricts the blood vessels and combined with all the other drugs I was on, my body's reaction was to take the blood from my extremities. My feet did have some color, but the toes were very black and friends and family were starting to get worried about my feet. I was given a tracheotomy to help with my breathing. The doctors did a wonderful job. Um, the cut was just made in the crease of my neck, deliberately to reduce the scar. Mm. I'm very pleased with the results and you can almost not see it. The tube in my tracking had to be changed every now and then. The first time I remember this happening, I was quite scared as the, as the nurse was doing it. She told me she was about to do it and I remember thinking the doctor should be doing it, not a nurse. So I was getting a bit anxious. Was she gonna make a mistake and kill me? As this was my first time in hospital as an adult, I didn't realise that in fact the nurses are just as qualified to do these jobs as the doctors are. So until I understood that, these little procedures felt quite scary. 19 days into my ICU stay, it was decided to give me a second round of kidney dialysis as my kidneys needed some help. Later, some photos were taken of my limbs to show to the specialist in East Grinstead. They normally deal with burns, but the nurses were saying that my skin was of similar appearance to burns. The nurses had to turn me from time to time to help prevent bed sores. I remember I was in pain and this process seemed to take forever. I guess I had to be careful because of all the tubes and bandages. They would have to lie me down flat and I had bad acid reflux and problems breathing when they did this. So I remember a lot of discomfort. 
the nurses would ask me if I wanted a bonus. I had no idea what she meant, but I soon figured out that when I said yes, I went to sleep. So I kept saying yes. I've since found out that the term is actually bolus, and this is basically a painkiller boost. Nurse Elaine was my favourite nurse. I've recently gone back to see her, and I know she actually exists. Uh, she was a very happy and efficient nurse who made me feel safe. At the time, I had issues trusting the nurses. I thought they were leaving me on my own. But she asked me if I trusted her, and straight away I replied yes. I thought there was a TV screen on the ceiling where the bright lights were, and I thought friends were typing messages on it, telling me to tell her about the other nurses. I think at one point I mentioned this, and she actually humoured me by trying to find the screen. I remember waking up at some point and looking cross-eyed at my nose. My parents were there, and my dad said I had quite a tan and a beard. The tan maybe ties in with my dreams, because I, I believe I actually had jaundice at the time. I wanted to see my face in the mirror. I think part of me wanted to know I was still all intact. The nurses had to hunt around for a mirror, and in the end I think they used someone's phone camera. Apparently I wasn't too impressed with the beard, so I asked for a shave. Nurse Elaine eventually decided to give it a go, and I think she enjoyed the shave more than me. She told me that she had the sharpest razor she could find. It was one of those bit plastic razors. It wasn't sharp enough, and there was a lot of tugging involved. I'm not sure if blood was spilt, but on the bright side I was on plenty of painkillers and she didn't put any aftershave on me afterwards. I don't remember my first bed bath, but I do remember being concerned something nasty had happened at one point. And I asked the classic question of, are all my bits down there still there? I think this was as the result of a bizarre bed bath accident related dream. Or maybe it might have been my catheter being changed. In which case I'm glad I don't remember that much, as a catheter being changed is not a very pleasant experience. After that, bed baths weren't that exciting. Physios were starting to work me hard. I remember them trying to move my arms. My fists were closed and clenched, but unfortunately the skin on my fingers was in such bad condition they couldn't do anything about it. This would cause me issues later. Somewhere about this time I had heart tachycardia twice. This is where your heart beats incredibly hard and fast and it feels like your heart is going to explode out of your chest. I was awake at that time and it was very scary. I thought after all I'd been through I was just about to die. I think I heard the nurse shouting that I was in trouble. I remember being scared and asking Nurse Elaine for my prognosis. I remember this as she seemed surprised I didn't know. The doctor came in soon afterwards and said that I could lose digits, as fingers, and both legs below the knee. I don't remember my reaction, but I think it was at a stage where I would ag agree with anything if it meant I would go home and be better. There were a lot of emotions at this time with my family as well. The consultant told them he was concerned about my feet. Nurses came over from East Grinstead to change the bandages on my arms and legs. I believe there was some issue later over getting hold of those bandages, or special bandages, as I remember that Nurse Elaine and her colleague were having a discussion at the end of my bed, and one of them had gone up to the theatre and raided the cupboards. Initially I'd been in an isolation room in the ICU. I'm not sure if I was there because of the meningitis and how contagious it can be, or because of all the open wounds I had. The isolation room had a scrub room and every time my parents or anyone else came in they had to scrub up, put an apron on and a mask on. The room had a very small window where two pigeons lived and I called them Bert and Ernie. But now I was moved into another room which had a bigger window and a better view. The nurses had turned my bed so I could look out of the window. I could see the fields in the distance. My parents later told me they asked them to do this as I like walking on the hills. I would be put in the chair looking out of the window, then I'd quickly fall asleep again. The physios called this chair the magic chair. I'm guessing though problems convincing some patients is a good idea. Physios are a bit like that. I thought the chair had built-in speakers for an iPod and remote controls. I, thought, I also thought this was going to be put in a plane to take me home. I'm guessing none of that was real. I remember thinking that the days are going by and I'm sleeping too much. I tried to stay awake but that didn't work. 
At one point the aircon in the room was turned off because of a deep clean next door. The room got so hot I thought I would die in the heat. My parents were there and I had this funny memory of my mum fanning me. While the physios were standing there doing nothing, I said, someone please help my mum and the physio took over. I had a brilliant daydream that I was filming a documentary for Channel 4 of behind the scenes at a hospital. I was awake but this thought just popped into my head. I thought someone had said the filming was over and that everyone in the hospital knew except for the nurse in the room with me. I wanted to go home now so I slowly tried to lift my heavy legs out of the bed. I remember the nurse spotting this and she got a little bit upset and asked me what I was doing. I told my parents that I had problems sleeping at night because of bad dreams and I was frightened of being alone. At some point I had a dream that doctors in the night were shouting and hurting people who weren't asleep. I kept thinking that the nurse wasn't around. Sometimes the tube on my trachea would pop out and it felt like ages before the nurse would come back and put it back in again. I was scared I would suffocate when that would happen. When I later left hospital I found some antidepressants amongst my meds. I asked what they were for and I was told because I had night terrors in ICU. I'm guessing they were prescribed for me about this time. Around this time my boss Matt came in to see me. We have since become firm friends and he has been incredibly supportive of me and my family. He told my parents they were shocked to see me in that state. I'm not surprised having seen the photos and I remember he bought in a box of chocolates and a car from work. I think I said I was okay and then probably went back to sleep again. But he told my parents that I seemed in high spirits. A couple of days later my arms were looking much better and I was moving my right thumb. My fingers were itching. They looked a bit like burnt sausages and the skin was dead. For the first time in about 29 days my mum and dad said they wouldn't come and visit me tomorrow as they needed a rest. My parents are truly amazing. I lived away from home for almost 20 years now. I see them almost every weekend for a catch up cuppa. But it's true what you hear, once a parent, always a parent. When I needed them, they were there. They kept coming to see me every day. I knew they were there during my first few days in ICU as I had fuzzy images of them sitting down in front of me. They also kept saying hello over and over again. And I think that I would keep opening my eyes seeing them and then going back to sleep. My hair was getting long and I felt like it was getting in my eyes. I think I was due for a haircut before I came into hospital, but this is now one month on from that. Unfortunately, there isn't a barber service in hospital as most patients don't stay for as long as I did. So one of the nurses kindly gave me a haircut. I'll always remember that nurse. Several months on, I went back to the ICU and met her. I recognized her straight away. I tailed back my emotions until that point, but then I said, you cut my hair, and I started to cry. At about this point, I remember thinking it must be getting near Christmas, and I asked the date, and I was told it was early December. The next thought that crossed my mind was that I hadn't done my Christmas shopping yet. 32 days into my stay in ICU on 8th of December, my parents were taken into a room off the main corridor by the vascular surgeon. He had already spoken to me. I don't remember the details of that conversation. He told them that I will have to amputate both legs below the knee and I will have to be transferred to a bigger hospital in a nearby city where I could have this operation. It was shocking news for my parents. They phoned my boss Matt and told him he was very upset to hear the news as well. I still had my trachea. Initially I could only faintly whisper, not really loud enough for anyone to hear and I was very short of breath. My visitors couldn't lit read but only my favourite nurse Elaine could so I would get really frustrated and roll my eyes. This is almost a family joke today but I think my parents at the time were a little upset because they couldn't understand me. Later I was able to use a speech valve which is a special valve they put into the trachea which enables you to talk. My throat was so incredibly dry I had no saliva in my mouth and I was gasping for a drink. It's never been as dry as that. The nurses would give me a little sponge on a lollipop stick to wipe my mouth with. I was told not to suck, but I did. Nurse Elaine even asked me if I was sucking and swallowing, but I lied and said no. Somehow I was able to swallow and love the lemon flavour, even though I hate lemon normally. I was asking for more and more sponge sticks. 
Eventually the speech therapist came in. He gave me three spoons of water and four of strawberry yogurt to test if I could swallow. I thought my agony was over but then he went away and the nurses told me I still couldn't eat or drink anything. I couldn't understand why and I remember being quite frustrated and trying to ask why but I never found out. My mum and dad were handling my post and trying to sort my bills but they weren't able to access my bank account to check if all was okay. That's banking security for you. I remember using a speech vow to tell them all was okay as I had direct debits but it does make you think now about what happens in case something like this happens again. Somewhere around this point the nurses were trying to make my lungs stronger by using something called CPAP. This is continuous positive airway pressure. I remember the nurses handing over and saying different settings it was on. I felt like I was breathing through a straw. Sometimes I felt like asking them to make it easier for me but then I went to sleep and it was better. I was getting very tired and presumably this was from the drugs and the situation with my legs and so I slept a lot. My consultant told my parents I would feel a lot better after my operation as the infection in the legs was making me ill. They were waiting for a critical care bed in the other hospital. I was moved a third time, this time from my room to near the reception desk in the ICU ward. I was right under the aircon unit so it was lovely and cool. I think I was only there for half a day and um, this could have been when they were waiting for the transport to take me to the hospital. I said something to the nurses about how I was going to ask them for help when I needed it so one of them got me a sealed bottle of pills. I could just move my arms enough to rattle the bottle but I also realised I could make a clicking noise with my mouth a bit like people do when they're talking to horses and that's how I got attention when I needed it. 38 days after I was admitted to the hospital I was transferred by ambulance. The journey to the other hospital usually takes only about 30 minutes by the car but I went in an ambulance with the sirens going as I was still on a ventilator. I'm not sure if I'm confused but I think someone in the ambulance was bagging me because the ventilator wasn't working. As soon as I got there I was wheeled into the ICU. I remember there was a young girl in the bed opposite me with her family there. They were watching me so I felt a little subconscious. I closed my eyes and then they were gone. I remember at some stage, I think this might have been quite soon after I arrived, that the nurses had trouble finding a vein for a central line. This led to one of those points where the patient is given too much information. They wanted to give me a subclavicle central line. I remember this phrase to this day. The doctors told me to turn my head and keep very still. He mentioned something about being very close to my heart. Thank you. I felt or heard a crunch and then it was done. A day after arriving I was taken into surgery for my first operation. This was a debridement to remove the dead skin on my hands and legs to see what could be saved. Occasionally I would feel like I couldn't breathe and I th thought I was about to suffocate. I think I was starting to fight the ventilator. I was wheeled into the anaesthetist room, this is the room you go into before theatre, and suddenly I felt like I couldn't breathe. The anaesthetist realised I was having a problem and asked what was wrong and I managed to mouth that I couldn't breathe but I felt like I was just about to pass out. Calmly she said she'd do something to help me. She reached under the table, turned something and then I was asleep. I think it might have been laughing gas. About a year later I met the same anaesthetist and I mentioned this to her and thanked her. It was odd I recognised her as the first time I met her I could only see her eyes above the mask. She checked my notes, realised I had in fact met her and we had a bit of a laugh about what happened. When I was a child I was in hospital for an operation. I remember at the time dreaming during the operation and then waking up and feeling sick. However the operations I've had since have been different. I would go to sleep without knowing it and then wake up in recovery very quickly after like nothing had happened. I was wheeled back to the ward. Initially my parents were told they could save both of my legs but then they later heard that the right leg would need to be amputated below the knee. The speech therapist came to see me. I think I remember talking or her talking about deflating the balloon cuff on my trachea. So this must have been just before they took the trachea out. She gave me a bourbon which is my favourite biscuit, some water, some squash and some yoghurt. She watched me chew and put a hand on my throat to check I was swallowing. At last my dry mouth was better. 
I think I fell in love with her. Over the next few days I had various tubes taken out so I wasn't so dependent. I came up with the phrase ninja nurse because at night time nurses would sneak around with torches. I would then wake up the next morning and realise that a tube was missing. The ninjas are whipped it out in the night. I'm not entirely sure that's what happened but that's what I remember. They did try taking my catheter out. This is something called TWOC, trial without catheter. I'm not sure quite what they expected me to do without a catheter as I couldn't sit up in bed or move around in bed or move my arms. So after a few hours of me lying there without my catheter, they brought around the bladder scanner. That's used to tell if I'm going to give birth to any wee. I think they realized I was getting a bit full and going nowhere so the tube was put back in. This is the first time I remember this experience and I think it hurts more coming out than going in, but it's definitely not pleasant. I had problems working out if it was daytime or nighttime. I remember once waking up and asking the time and I think they said it was nine o'clock, but I didn't know if it was day or night. I got a bit confused, wondering if I should try to stay awake or go to sleep. That's because in the last hospital there was a clock in front of me and a window beside me, but here the window is behind me and there was no clock. I still had a lot of dead skin in my fingers and the dead skin was rubbing against patches of new skin and feeling really rough. I remember waking up some mornings with my fists clenched hard together and scratchy fingers feeling heavy and like rock. I will panic for a few seconds when I woke up wondering what was wrong with my fingers until I remembered. I had an oxygen tube just under my nose. This would help make my nose incredibly dry and it would get blocked. I asked the nurses to help me blow my nose and it's actually incredibly difficult to blow your nose with someone else holding the tissue. You should try it sometime. There was a bit of weaning off this as the, my oxygen saturation was quite low but eventually I was glad to be off the oxygen. On the 19th of December the ninja nurses had removed my trachea and the feeding tubes were out. The only line I had now was my catheter. At last I was able to speak properly. I was very hoarse and croaky and I could only speak a little louder than a whisper but I asked for a phone so I could call my parents. I was very grateful to the nurses as they had a cordless phone at reception which they lent to me. They had to balance it on my shoulder as I couldn't move my arms or fingers. My parents were so very excited to hear my voice on the phone. Then I had to ask for a nurse when I was done to help me hang up the phone but the process worked so I made a couple of phone calls to parents and friends. I was very grateful for that phone. As I couldn't move my arms or legs very much I needed help to eat. The nurses didn't seem to be with me very often and sometimes they were looking after three or four beds at a time. So the meal would be delivered to my table but I couldn't eat it and I had to ask for a nurse to help feed me. But I couldn't shout to get their attention so sometimes it took a few minutes to get someone to feed me. There was one lovely nurse who I think said she was a nurse assistant who saw my plight and helped me. She said if the same thing happened the next time she would help me again which she did. I never found out her name and have not seen her since but somehow I would like to thank her for that. I do remember some other staff. There was a lovely nurse named Noelle. I think it was near Christmas so her name was perfect. There was also a male nurse who frustrated the other nurses because he was always wandering off and talking to someone else. And there was a doctor who I thought was Italian but it was actually Spanish. I met him again recently and he remembered me. One time I had a phone call and he shouted out, it's from my girlfriend in my hometown. This made me a bit confused, but actually it turned out to be Nurse Elaine who called me to chat and ask how I am. Elaine, if you ever watch this, thank you. I owe you so much. As I couldn't move around in the bed, going for number two was a bit of a problem. The nurses had a solution to the sling and the hoist. I was shuffled from one side to the other as they passed a sling under me and then I was hoisted up into a sitting position. This felt a little bit painful at times and I was also careful to ensure the catheter and any other vital bits of me didn't get caught up. The other problem was that my legs were, had terrible cramp behind the knees and there was one point in the procedure where I had to be moved from one side of the hoist to the other. For that I had to bend my legs backwards a fraction and that was very painful. Eventually I'd be sitting over the bedpan and they'd leave me for a bit. One time, I think it was early morning, I was sitting in my sling looking out the window into a window in the building opposite. There was a light on and someone moving around. I think they were in a kitchen. 
How nice to be perched on the loo with a view. When I'd finished, they'd lift me up and put me back onto the bed. This made me chuckle because sometimes I'd say, for God's sake, make sure and take me up and not down, as I was hovering over the pan. Also, quite often the battery would run out and the nurses calmly assured me that the thing would auto-reverse if the battery didn't work. I was getting a little bit bored in ICU, but then sometimes I'd just stare and watch the nurses moving around and doing things. I remember hearing the theme tune to Sharp playing over and over again. I was a bit jealous as someone must have been watching it on the television. So I invented a new game called Catheter Watch. I decided to market this when I got out of hospital. I'd wait until a bubble appeared in my catheter tube, then I would ask the nurse for water until I saw the bubble move. Fun. After 47 days, which is almost seven weeks of being in ICU in two different hospitals, I was finally moved up onto the ward. The date was Wednesday the 23rd of December. Nurse Noel came with me. The porter pushed me and my bed into the lift. It was so quiet. I was crying, Noel was crying. Then a lovely Spanish nurse with big black glasses welcomed me to the ward. Everything felt so different. I was put in the bed by the window and the door. I later found out this is where they put the naughty patients or patients that they need to keep an eye on. I'm not sure which one I was. The chap in the bed next to me kept his curtains closed all the time, so I was in a cosy bay. This made me feel secure, but it also meant I couldn't see out of the window. I started to realise more what was going on. I was very glad to be alive. I kept saying life is good to myself. There was a little bit of me which thought I was still in ICU and dreaming all of this. It took me a while to get over that and very occasionally, even now, I wonder if I'm still there dreaming. I could just move my arms but initially I struggled to lift a water jug. I was so incredibly thirsty but it felt like it was going straight through me into the catheter. Slowly the cloud of drugs started to lift. I asked the nurse what the little bits in my catheter pipe was. She said it was all the muck coming out of my kidneys and I needed to drink more. I got my phone back which felt like I got my life back. I phoned family and friends and sent lots of text messages. My phone didn't respond well to my scabby fingers but luckily my mum had pulled to this and brought in a stylus for me to type with. I invited friends to visit and asked for some cranberry juice to clear my kidneys. I started to write down what I could remember of being in ICU. I started to write down the crazy dreams I had. So that was the end of my ICU experience. There are more talks coming. I'll tell you about my crazy dreams when I was in ICU and what happened to my legs.